starts live right now. Concession stand. Top Republicans like Attorney General William William Barr and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell are buying into the president's allegations of voter fraud. President Trump is 100% within his rights to look into allegations of irregularities in his legal option. How the Trump team is digging in and saying that conceding is not an option. That word's not even in our vocabulary right now. Can they sell this to the American people? Or is it time to close up shop? Plus, he's the Democratic challenger in Georgia, fighting to paint the peach state blue. It's not just that you're a crook, Senator. You're attacking the health of the people that you represent. John Ossoff is live to talk about his plan to knock out incumbent Republican Senator David Perdue in a possible runoff election that could determine the balance of power in the Senate. And Fox Sports analyst Emmanuel Acho is talking about how the death of George Floyd inspired him to start uncomfortable conversations with a black man. Here come hot topics with Whoopi, Sarah Haynes, Joy Behar, Sonny Austin, and Megan McCain. Now, let's get things started. Well, hello and good morning and welcome to The View. President-elect Joe Biden, <laughs> I just got to say it again, President-elect Joe Biden uh, has just 71 days for his transition team to prepare to take over. But the current administration is holding up the taxpayer-provided fund to make it happen because they're going all in on voter fraud claims. Let's take a look. This election is not over. Far from it. Let's not have any lectures. No lectures about how the president should immediately, cheerfully accept preliminary election results from the same characters who just spent four years refusing to accept the validity of the last election. There are serious allegations of violations of law. The right standard is that every single legal vote that was cast should be counted. But any votes that were illegally cast shouldn't be counted. Democrats could give a damn about this. They don't care how Trump lost as long as he lost. So how do you know if something was illegally cast? And how do you know? I mean, where do you draw the line? I think you mentioned this, Sarah, yesterday. I mean, so does that mean that only the things below president and vice president are also are no good? I mean, because there's a whole lot of people on that list that people voted for. So are they okay? Or does that mean Mitch McConnell has to? We got to recount for Mitch McConnell and then recount for uh, whoever else that was talking. I can't even th put their heads, their names Lindsay. in my head. I mean, Lindsay, <laughs> Lindsay Graham. I mean, so does that mean we need to recount all of that as well? Because that's not okay? Because no, just half of it. This just half, but which half? Oh, just the top half, I see. Just get rid of the top half, because he doesn't like it. <laughs> that was very crazy. Anyway, a, a, Attorney General Bill Barr uh, also broke from protocol by allowing investigators to pursue claims of fraud before votes are certified. So what does this mean? Because they have, they keep counting. He's not close enough to make a real big difference. So what is the point of all of this? Are they just going to keep this going for how long, Sonny? You know, I think the point of all of it is to um, sow discord and, and certainly um, sow some sort of, um, well, to sow discord. And, and I also think, Whoopi, this is really dangerous because people now are questioning our very democracy and uh, questioning the legitimacy of, of Joe Biden's uh, you know, election and and and, and that as president, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's terrible. What what also is is very disconcerting is that every serious empirical study shows that voter fraud is not a real thing. I mean, that is just not an accurate thing. It's just non-existent, virtually non-existent in the United States. What does exist in the United States, as we all know, is voter suppression. So the fact that you have someone like the Attorney General of the United States politicizing the Department of Justice is really, really troubling. And you have people like Richard uh, Pilger, a career 
prosecutor who heads the um, elections crimes branch in the Justice Department's public integrity section withdrawing and resigning from that section should raise a lot of alarms, a lot of red flags for the American people because career prosecutors do not resign their positions. And I worked at the Justice Department. The Justice Department is apolitical. It is very rare for you to know the, uh, the politics of the chief of a unit, of the line uh, assistant. You just don't know that. And so when you right. see Attorney General Barr breaking tradition, a 40-year tradition of interfering with an election by the Justice Department and making sure that that, that the Justice Department is now, I don't know, President Trump's uh, personal law firm. Uh, the very foundation yeah. of our democracy and all our public systems is being attacked from the inside, from the inside. Right. So, Joy, when you see all of this and you hear uh, them say, well, this, you know, they've spent four years fighting. Didn't we spend four years fighting that particular election because people interfered with it and we knew that they that the Russians had interfered at, but none of none of us said now get out no. or am I wrong do you did you no. say you know, oh, I didn't think so go ahead no no no, no what, I, what I'm what I'm thinking right now is that forget about Trump let's look at the Republican Party for a second we're looking at basically a, a, a bankrupt party that has no center has no core uh, they don't have a philosophy anymore. Deficits, who cares, as long as it's Republicans creating it. The military, well, we can diss the military, even though we said, oh, my God, the military. So they only care about two things, power and retaining power and their pocketbook, taxes. That's basically the party right now. So um, they are fearful of mail-in voting. Jill Lindsey Graham said the following. If we don't do something about voting by mail, we're going to lose the ability to elect a Republican in this country. The coronavirus has shown that mail-in voting on a grand scale works, but it seemed to work better for the Democrats, just like the Electoral College works better for the Republicans, even though we won the Electoral College also this time. But those are the things that scare them. So all they can do is what Sonny says, they can suppress the vote. And they can claim that it's all a big fraud. Out of the millions of votes cast, only 32 cases, I believe, of fraud were even identified. So it's just spitting in the wind. Now, one more thing. As far as Mitch McConnell is concerned, Georgia is on his mind. Georgia. Because if we take Georgia, the Democrats take the Senate in Georgia, he loses power. He is possessed to keep that power. He wants it. And I think that if they lose power in Georgia, um, uh, if they win, rather, if they maintain the power, McConnell will drop this whole right. thing. Because that's all he cares about. He wants the base to be riled up against the Democrats and vote against right. the Democrat in Georgia. That's what he's all about. So Trump has right. become irrelevant so, to us. Concentrate on the Republican right. leadership now and Mitch McConnell. Right. So, Sarah, so you think that Mitch McConnell is saying and all those votes that were cast were cast some of those votes were cast illegally i mean how do you know who was voting how do you know who was i mean you're basically saying that republicans also didn't come out and vote clearly uh for their president i mean it's just insane when you look at it do you think that they are aware they're casting dispersions on their own party as well they're hoping that they've confused people enough that they don't make that distinction that we've made before, that while touting the wins in mm -hmm. keeping Senate seats and the the uh, Congress flipping, or sorry, excuse me, the House flipping, that those votes were okay, but that the ones that they lost were not okay, which is on the same ballot. So I think this counting and recounting is well within their legal rights. And if they want to waste time and resources doing this, they're not going to find anything. So go ahead, do what you need to do. Because right now, Biden yes. and Harris have they've moved on they're starting to attend to the business at hand which is this pandemic i'm not surprised these lead G uh republicans are not doing anything else because even though trump is no longer the president he will remain powerful in that party and for them to continue to be re-elected they need those over 70 million voters 
that voted this time for them. Now, the interesting thing is this is all going to be counted. All this legal action will be done on the state and local level. And Republicans in Georgia are saying, you know, this doesn't rise to the number necessary to change the outcome. They, they say it's hoaxes and nonsense. Like you guys, like until we see proof, these are Republicans on the ground in Georgia saying yeah. that. So yeah. I think that, and by the way, when Fox News starts cutting away from Kaylee McEnany because they're saying, you know, we can't in good conscience air this when Fox is the watchdog, I think the right powers are at play here. And so I think it's like a bad breakup when someone's taking the couch, they're burning your clothes, like let them do whatever they need to do on the way out. Just get out. As long as they're, trust Fox. As long as they're going Do not out. trust yeah. Fox. Yeah. But the other thing that I think is amazing is that people, you know, the, the taxpayer's money that goes into this fund that helps begin the transition is being held up by the man sitting in yeah. office. I'd like to say... I'm sure we could talk to Bloomberg or any of the other folks uh, that have a lot of money to loan us some money so we can start the process while they, you know, puts around and try to figure out what's going on. Because it's not going to stop what's happening. It's just, you know, I don't understand what the point is because you're only hurting yourselves. And he's going to be much more embarrassed when he finds out. In fact, he didn't win. Four states have already said, you show us the proof. Show us the proof. That's all we want. Show us where it's real. And if it's not real, we're not going through with this. So let them fucks around and do everything they need to do, you know, because they're not willing to suck it up, clearly. We'll be right back. Still ahead, name and shame, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is calling on people to keep a list of Republicans who she's accusing of blindly siding with President Trump. Is she holding them responsible for their actions or going all in on cancel culture? Momentous, historic, and now with so much on the line, listening to every view matters. If we are to heal and unify our country, we must speak truth. And that's why The View is all new. There's no show like yours. We're The View on ABC. Wait a minute. You still haven't got in on View Your Deals early holiday shopping spree with free shipping? Well, don't sweat it, because it's still happening. We partnered with vendors for this half-off awesome gifts for everyone on your list, plus the gift of free shipping. So get to ViewYourDeal.com now. Welcome back. Congresswoman Acacia, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez doesn't want people to forget the people who continue to enable you-know-who. In a tweet asking, is anyone archiving the you-know-who sycophants when they try to downplay or deny their complicity in the future? Do you foresee a decent probability of many deleted writings and tweets and photos in the future? Is she trying to make sure they are held accountable or is she sort of advocating cancel culture? I'll start with you, Sarah. What's your thoughts? I'm not sure what she's trying to do here, but she's got to remember that over 70 million people voted for this outgoing administration and the Republican Party. So these people will work again. And honestly, the sleaziest in this culture can still sell a book or a movie like it's going to happen. Uh, people that hire them will do their appropriate checks and balances. But this is a bit about archiving or making a list kind of reminds you of the Red Scare and McCarthyism. So I, I think it's a slippery slope to endorse this type of action. And I think she needs to do what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris said in their victory speeches. It's time to cooperate and come together right now. She represents people that need help. We're in the throes of a pandemic and health care is being considered in a conservative leaning Supreme Court right now. We've got stimulus checks that haven't come out. We've got uh, we could work on our minimum wage increases. There's a, a thousand things that could help her people. So I think focusing on positive change and just leaving trolling to Twitter because they do a great job at it. <laughs> Right. And Sonny, what do you think? Is this, the, is this the right direction to be thinking right now? Or is she sort of late in saying, hey, is anybody watching this? You know, I think that Trump um, tear gassed peaceful protesters for a photo op. Um, I think that Trump ripped children from their parents. I think that Trump called NFL players sons of bitches, I think that uh, for exercising their First Amendment rights. Um, and I think those people in his administration um, that 
not only drafted some of those policies, uh, but were complicit in, in those policies shouldn't be forgotten. People like Kirsten Nielsen, people like Stephen Miller, people like Kellyanne Conway, people like uh, Vice President Pence, who uh, was woefully inadequate as, at his role of being the head of the coronavirus task force, and people like Ben Carson uh, and Betsy DeVos. Um, I, I don't think that those people should uh, be able to profit from their experience uh, within the Trump administration, and I don't think that they should be forgotten, and I don't think that we should look the other way. I think we need to remember, because if you don't remember things, then past becomes prologue. And um, I do think that people need to be held accountable for their actions, and um, I don't think it is yeah. reminiscent of McCarthyism at all. Okay, so what do you, what's your opinion? You, you, go ahead. Well, we will remember. We will remember. The, the newspapers, the, you know, uh, Facebook, Twitter, everybody's going to remember who these people are. But let's not, you know, everybody is not in the same basket, in my opinion. On the one hand, you have people like Flynn, Manafort, Stone, and Trump who actually have committed crimes, and they need to go to jail, period. Um, then you have people who have been cruel, like Miller and Sessions, by uh, separating those right. children. And now we don't even, even the lawyers can't right. find their parents who are trying to do it now. So I, I think you have to be right. specific about who you're going to target as collaborators. Right. As far as Kellyanne Conway and those people, they're just mediocrities who will try to scrape around another job and they'll pop up somewhere. But people like the Mooch, let's say, take, take the Mooch, or, or Michael Cohen, uh, these are people who have turned right. a corner big time. It's like John Dean from the Nixon administration, who now works at MSNBC, you know? So, um, I mean, yeah. I'm in touch with Scaramucci and here and there, Michael Cohen. These are guys who really mean it at this point. So I don't think they belong on the list. Yeah, John. And, and you're right, Sarah. Okay. You don't want to play their game. Every enemy's list has been coming from the right. We don't need to do it also. All right, we'll be back. Our new president-elect Joe Biden isn't the only person poised to turn the tide in America, and that's why all eyes are on Georgia right now. Our next guest is in a heated runoff Senate race against Republican Senator David Perdue. Now, could that help shift the balance of the entire U.S. Senate? US Senate? It, it may. So please welcome Democratic challenger John Ossoff. Sonny has the first question. Yes. Uh, John, thank you for joining us. Well, Joe Biden won the presidency, even though the race in your home state of Georgia still hasn't been called. What was your reaction when you heard the news that uh, former Vice President Joe Biden is now the president-elect? Hey, y'all. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. And look, I mean, like so many, I took a deep breath and felt relief that we are turning the page on these four years of constant outrage and division and scandal, and most of all, the catastrophic incompetence, which has cost so many lives, ripped our country apart, gotten us deeper into this mess that we find ourselves in now. And I think that as the dust settles on this presidential race, we got to recognize we're still in the midst of a pandemic, a profound public health crisis. Hundreds of thousands of lives hang in the balance. Millions of livelihoods and jobs and homes and businesses hang in the balance. And the task now is to mount a competent and focused public health response and get economic relief to people who are suffering so we can jumpstart this economy, get back to normal. It is a profound fact that the balance of power in the United States Senate is also is coming down to Georgia, right there. Uh, both Senate races there are going to run off elections in January, one between Democrat Raphael Warnock and Republican Kelly Leffler, and one between you, Mr. Ossoff, and your opponent, Republican incumbent David Perdue. Democrats need to win both seats to take control of the Senate and get anything done. With so much at stake, what are the Democrats going to do to turn out the vote? Well, we're doing everything in our power to motivate people to get back out to the polls. And the sense of enthusiasm and excitement, we are invigorated in Georgia by this recent victory in the presidential race. But we also recognize that in order for us to recover from this pandemic and in order for us to enact a policy program that will help people, we need to be able to govern. 
And that comes down to these two races here in Georgia. I mean, the work that's been done in Georgia over the last 10 years, y'all, is just incredible. The work led by Stacey Abrams, voter registration, mobilizing communities, reaching out to voters who hadn't heard from politicians in a very long time. We really have the wind at our backs, and now it's about getting folks back out to the polls for this January 5th runoff. President Trump has continued to falsely assert that the election is being stolen from him and is pushing for a recount in several states, including Georgia, where he trails by a razor-thin margin. Now Senators Perdue and Leffler are attacking Georgia's Secretary of State, who also happens to be Republican himself, for a lack of transparency in this election and are calling for his resignation. Do you think there's any basis for these claims? I think that they are in disarray because they felt entitled to a cakewalk here. I mean, y'all, when I announced this campaign about 14 months ago, I was telling everybody that Georgia was the most competitive state in the country. And I'm sure that y'all didn't doubt me, but there were a lot of people who did. But it is all that work on voter registration and mobilization and organizing and volunteerism that has made Georgia the most important battleground state in America right now. I mean, that's shocking to a lot of folks who think of Georgia as this sort of GOP stronghold where we can't compete. Now it's the top battleground in the country. And I think that these incumbent Republican senators just felt entitled to an easy dance back to victory. They're in for the fights of their lives. They don't like it. But rather than organizing and getting out the vote to win, they're taking it out on each other. Now, now you're right. Georgia has become the key battleground state uh, now. It hasn't gone blue, though, since 1992. Uh, and that's largely, I think, because of changing demographics and the work of Stacey Abrams to register black voters and increase uh, voter turnout. Are you surprised by the numbers you're seeing? I, I don't think so. But <laughs> does it signal to you a new political future in Georgia? It does. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. There's been so much work put into this over the last 10 years. So much hard work. You mentioned Stacey Abrams, all of the amazing volunteers and activists who have made this possible. And it, it, it comes at this moment when we really need this fresh start as a country. I mean, I don't know about y'all. The last four years have just been so exhausting, so miserable, and not just for Democrats, but for all of us. The constant division and all of the outrage and scandal and insult, it just doesn't have to be this way. We got to take a deep breath and recognize that now we have the opportunity to define a new era in our history, to heal this country, to bring Americans back together, to remember that we're one people, we're all brothers and sisters, and we face a crisis right now, and we've got to come together to meet this moment, and I am so excited that Georgia has the opportunity to deliver these two victories so that we can meet this moment, so that we can chart a new course forward, we can overcome this pandemic, and we can deliver for working families across this country. More with John Ossoff when we come back. John Ossoff, Joy. Yes. So, um, John, you made headlines during a recent debate when you called out your opponent, Senator Perdue, over his handling of the pandemic. Let's take a look at the clip. Well, perhaps Senator Perdue would have been able to respond properly to the COVID-19 pandemic if you hadn't been fending off multiple federal investigations for insider trading. It's not just that you're a crook, Senator. It's that you're attacking the health of the people that you represent. You did say COVID-19 was no deadlier than the flu. You did say there would be no significant uptick in cases. All the while, you were looking after your own assets and your own portfolio. Well, of course, Purdue has denied any wrongdoing, and he says that the Department of Justice the, uh, the and the Senate Ethics Committee have cleared him completely, um, the SEC also. But you seem to have rattled him. Because I just... Is he going to do another uh, debate with you before the runoff? Now you're scared of him, I think. Y'all, he did not enjoy that at all. He, he canceled our next debate just hours after that. And I just challenged him to three more yesterday. I'm ready. Hey, Senator Perdue, if you watch The View, I'm ready to debate. Come out to a public forum. Defend your record in office. And let's hear your vision for representation of this state. I mean, y'all, Senator Perdue hadn't held a public town hall meeting in six years. He feels entitled to this seat. But this is not David Perdue's Senate seat. This is the people's Senate seat. And the people are going to come out and vote on January 5th to claim it. 
Well, even after pouring money into key races, $200 million in Kentucky and South Carolina alone, Democrats failed to flip several seats in the Senate and even lost some in the House. Now, it wasn't exactly the blue wave uh, many of us had expected. What did Democrats get wrong and what needs to change going forward? Well, you'll have to forgive me for not having that sort of national analysis. What I can tell you is what's working in Georgia. And that is a relentless focus on how we get out of this mess. I mean, yeah, y'all asked me kind of what I felt when I learned that uh, President like Biden had won. And I was like, oh, this is hope. What I felt was hope that we can get out of this crisis, not just the pandemic, but also this terrible headspace we've been in as a country, the way that our spirit has been corrupted by the last four years of nonsense. We have an opportunity now to launch a new era for this country that can bring us back together. We can look out for each other again. We can make sure everybody can afford health care. We can make sure that everybody has the opportunity to do dignified work that pays a living wage. We can make sure every family has access to affordable health care and affordable housing. We can make sure every American has equal justice under the law, regardless of race and regardless of class. That's the kind of country that I want to live in. That's the kind of country that we believe in as Americans. That's why my mother came here as an immigrant when she was 23 years old, was because she believed in that America. So let's build that America again. Let's make it better and stronger, more just, and more prosperous. All right. Listen, our thanks to you, John Ossoff. You come back anytime to The View. We love talking to you. We'll be right back. Thank you. Sports analyst and former NFL player Emmanuel Ocho has started a long overdue talk about race relations in America in his online series and now a new book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And since the series is almost 70 million views and counting, it looks like people are actually ready to finally listen. So let us welcome Emmanuel Ocho. What's happening? Welcome to The View. Sarah has the first question. Yeah, Emmanuel, it's so great to have you here today. Um, you aired your first episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man in June, and it quickly went viral. What made you start doing this, and what was your goal with it? Yes, there. in the wake of the, the death of George Floyd, I realized we're not only battling a virus of the body in COVID-19, we're actually vi battling a virus of the mind and of the heart and racism. And as a black man, I said, more than anything, it is my job to be a positive conduit towards racial reconciliation. I realized there's a communication barrier between my black brothers and sisters and my white brothers and sisters. And because I was fully immersed in white culture in high school and fully immersed in black culture in the NFL, let me try to bridge the gap so we can continue to mend this rift between black people and white people in this country. You know something, Emmanuel, I think you may be a treasure that we're looking for. <laughs> Since June, you have released 10 episodes of this series, and in one of the most recent, you sat down with police officers from Petaluma, California, to yeah. talk about the divide between the black community and police officers. What do you think they took away from the conversation? Well, Joy, get this. The first question I asked these gentlemen was, when's the last time you had a conversation with a group of black people? They're in Petaluma, California, population of 60,000, less than 1% black. And the resounding answer was, well, Emmanuel, I don't think we've ever had a conversation with a group of black people. I said this, Joy, I said proximity breeds care and distance breeds fear. If you're not proximal to people that don't look like you, sound like you, then you will be more apt to be scared of them. So what did they take away from this conversation? It opened their minds, realizing, wait, when I come across somebody who I didn't grow up with, when I come across somebody who doesn't look like me, maybe I should respond, treat them differently. Because if we did a better job of disarming verbally, then we wouldn't have to discharge the weapons physically. Emmanuel, um, you also sat down uh, for a fascinating conversation with NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. Now, he has apologized for not understanding why players were kneeling and said he wished he would have listened to Colin Kaepernick earlier. After speaking with him, do you think he really has had this change of heart on the issue? And what does the NFL have to do uh, better in order to support uh, their players? 
Well, Sonny, I do think he's had a change of heart. Here's the uh, part of the problem in our society, cancel culture. As soon as somebody states an opinion, they're never allowed to change their opinion in our society. It's as if they can't learn and grow and evolve. Roger Goodell has self-admittedly learned. Listen, he's grown up and he has evolved. He said, I heard what the players were saying, but it wasn't until I saw it that I had a change. What can he now do? Continue to get out the stands, continue to get off the sidelines. In football, the players play and the fans, they clap and they cheer. Well, it's up to the owners, it's up to the commissioner to not be a, a fan in racial reconciliation, but to be an active player. Get involved, talk to your players in your different cities and figure out what you can specifically do in your city to bridge this gap. That's what he can do. That's what he's starting to do. Emmanuel, you've said that if white people are the problem, then they also have to be part of the solution. I, like many, want to be part of this conversation. So how can I be a good ally and be part of the solution? That's a great question, Sarah. It's not just about intention. It's about direction. And that's why I wrote the book. So many people have great intentions. Well, Emmanuel, I want to be a part of the solution. Well, first you have to know what to do. And so I wrote the book kind of to be a manual on there is an issue. I understand the issue. Now that I know what the issue is and I fully understand the issue, my empathy has grown and now I can be a part of the solution. What does that look like? First, that looks like having conversations. You have to know exactly what is going on with your black brothers and sisters. My black brothers and sisters, understanding the disconnect with the white brothers and sisters, after you understand the problem, the specific problem that may exist in your neighborhood, in your community, um, with your friends, that is how you can now act. But Sarah, it's not enough to just talk about it. It's now after you talk and you learn, everyone commit to doing something. I, I do wonder what Roger Goodell is going to uh, do with uh, Colin Kaepernick and, and uh, the career that, that has been uh, ruined. Um, but I, I want to talk to you about your book because I read it and I think it's fantastic. Uh, you've turned the, the, the Uncomfortable Conversation series into a book. Tell us about it and what are you hoping people uh, will learn from it? Uh, well, I believe that the spoken word has sizzled. My videos, like you all said, over 70 million views now. That's great, but I didn't do this for clicks. I didn't do this for likes. I did this to make change. I would rather substance than sizzle. So the reason for writing this book is so everyone realizes they can individually make change. I want this book to be like the figurative baton that is passed off in a relay race. You read it, you understand it, and then you hand it off so that we can all run this race towards reconciliation. I believe this, Sonny, if each individual realizes they can affect their neighborhood well that neighborhood it's a part of the city and that city can affect that state which it's a part of and that state can have an impact on the nation and the nation the greater world around us but it all starts with the individual i'll end with this example and when i was a kid i used to play with dominoes and i would stack up a hundred dominoes and i would push the first domino over and i would watch it knock each and every domino after that over but remember the first domino it never had the intention of knocking over the hundredth domino it only had the intention of knocking over the next domino. And so as it, as it pertains to racial reconciliation, don't try to do everything. Just do anything. And don't let your inability to do everything keep you from doing anything at all. There you go. So thank you, Emmanuel. You also need to come back and talk to us some more. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. His book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, is out today. And we, of course, will be right back.